most of you know who Andrew Rafkin is, but I'll mention a few things about his bio, which I pulled from uh, Wikipedia, the source of <laughs> knowledge. Um, so, a nonfiction science writer. Uh, some people would say my writing in science is mostly fiction. I try to argue against that. <laughs> um, and he's written on topics from the Amazon rainforest, uh, tsunamis, science and politics, climate change, and the North Pole. And for the North Pole, you wrote a book, is that right, about that? And you were the first uh, New York Times reporter to report from the North Pole physically on, on location, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, and now you are associated, uh, among other things, you spent a good bit of time as a writer with the New York Times. And you still have the with the opinions page, I believe, is it? You do a blog, and you spent a good bit of your career with the New York Times. And now you're associated with Pace University, and you're a senior fellow for environmental understanding. Uh, you've received a number of awards uh, in communication. One of these from the National Academy of Science. Uh, two, okay, and uh, other things. <laughs> And they, and they were over a different period of time? The, yeah. okay. I'm the only, I'm the only okay, and what were they for particular pieces of work? Yeah, yeah one was for the blog, and one right. was for the uh, quick Okay. Um, other thing I found interesting, which I didn't know, is that uh, Andrew wrote a piece in the New York Times, which is inspiration for a movie that was later done involving, was it Mark Wahlberg and what not, about a, a rock star, very interesting. And speaking of rock stars, I also didn't know you are also a musician. And so you play several instruments or one? Uh, anything with strings. Anything with strings. Yeah, anything with strings. So um, it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, please. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. So I'm going to. Try to keep it brief so we can have time for, t for chat. Um, the new, you, you know, again, so I've been writing about, this is my 30th year writing about climate, which is kind of scary, 3-0. <laughs> uh, and, and basically the story is the same. Um, slowly building understanding that we're changing the system that historically we had a one-way relationship with the climate system. All through human history, climate did stuff and you either died or moved out of the way or put on clothes or lit a fire. And, and it's just in the last 50 years, the science has really built saying that we're now changing the climate. We have, it's a two-way relationship. We're influencing the system in ways, uh, many of which are clear cut, and many of which are still hard, hard to understand. The pace of change is really hard to uh, project, even though the pace of the buildup of the gas, that's the main heat trapping gas, is easy to understand. So, um, and none of this fits the way we've communicated historically. Uh, and I'll, I'll sort of explore my evolution as a communicator and the evolution of our understanding of climate change at the same time. And it's made things really, it's really, it's one of the more challenging issues you can, the, it's, I think it's the hardest issue to convey to the public in a way that has traction. Because, of, well, there are many reasons we can talk about. But, uh, but despite all that, I'm, I am a relentless optimist as long as people are engaged and, and really dig in on what the science says and doesn't say, then we can find new, especially with the new tools we have, um, and you'll see some of them sound like they're very noisy and complicated and confusing. Twitter, and I think the, the, the new system ultimately can be a benefit. So I asked this question, um, is the online communication environment good for the real environment? It's still kind of an open question. Um, and I, but my answer, as I said, is yes. Although I always put an asterisk and, and actually it's, pr it's a pretty big asterisk. <laughs> Because there's so many ifs. Uh, everything can be used for good or ill. Um, you can sell Coca-Cola and um, fast cars, or you can sell sustainability. And guess which one is an easier sale? <laughs> you know, we like things that roar and zoom. And, and then there was this comfort factor. Those of us, let's see, one, two, three. I think there's five of us who spent m more than half of our life in the 20th century. <laughs> uh, is that about right? I think about right. So for, if you grew up in the 20th century, um, you grew up with a very different media model than people grew up with today. You had this, these like, very kindly, smart, older gentlemen, and then occasionally there'd be, they started to be a woman and then a, 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 an African-American. But it was always some guy like Walter Cronkite, and, and, um, and it was so simple, because they were just... This is my last broadcast. Just listen to the way he ended his newscast. News, 
And that's the way it is, Friday, March 6th, 1981. That's the way it is. We didn't have to think about anything. Someone every night while you're having your supper, and literally it was for us, you know, we'd be having a spaghetti and he would, he would say, that's the way it is. So that's it. <laughs> we might debate, we, my dad and I, you know, my, my brother and I and my father would debate the Vietnam War a little bit, but mostly it was like, we didn't have to think too much. The world was handed to us, information was handed to us. And now if you think about climate change, it's like this, you know, you go out on the web and whatever your feelings about climate change, if you're really worried about it, if you're totally skeptical, you can go feed yourself a spaghetti dinner of information. They'll have the same comfort fact level that, you know, back, back in the 60s, 70s, basically we had a communal comfort meal every night. We all had the same mac and cheese or the same whatever. And now you can go out and it's like a buffet. If you're a skeptic, you can find something to feast on. If, if you're a liberal, you can find something to feast on. If you're a scientist and you just want to be clear on what you're looking at, you can find something to, to bathe yourself with the understanding of what the science says. And it's worse than this. I'm going to take you down, by the way. We're going to go way down and then before I express my optimism. All of that stuff, all of that stuff that if you care about climate change or whatever your issue is that you really worry about or think about, that's all in the middle of this. This is a website called newsmap.jp. And it's uh, basically what the world is thinking right now or watching what, what media, media platforms, what stories they're, they're stressing. And this gives you a real time look at that. I just uploaded this. Uh, an hour or so ago. So this is the global look. And you can do it by country. You see at the top, you can kind of click. It's really fascinating. <laughs> and now here's, uh, here's the United States. So what, you know, there's actually an environmental story, which is interesting. That's a big deal right now. Um, but here's that, that previous slide I was posting here, just to give you, just to give you a little, I, it's not quantitative, but that tells you that basically everything about climate is competing with all this other stuff that really does concern us on an hour to hour, day to day basis. And there are other issues with online communication that are really troubling. You've probably, you may have heard of a book, there was a book written by uh, Ellie Pariser several years ago called the, uh, the Filter Bubble. And he made the observation that, you know, essentially, it's, this is like a cell wall for the biologists in the room, and you know, you're in, the, in there, you're blue, see the word, the word you is blue. Out in the world is all this different information, and the portals through which information gets to you are around the, are the cell wall. You know, so, but it's a pervious cell wall, but it's selective. So when you, you, the information you get is all blue. Again, if you're liberal or libertarian or American or, or urban or Northeastern or you're a farmer, you tend to your friends on Facebook. Well, they're your friends. They're kind of probably sort of like you. So, so I, when I teach courses at Pace now in communication in this new environment, the first thing I say is you have to recognize you're in a bubble in order to work around the bubble. So once you recognize that, then you can follow some people on Twitter who are, who are ideologically different than you, but who are not you know, spouting ridiculousness. F find people who you respectfully disagree with and bring them in into your life, into your, your funnel, and you have a better chance of um, kind of keeping track of what the real world is. And it's fine to live, you know, most of us live in bubbles. We, you, know, you read Paul Krugman or you read George Will, and, you, you know, and, and uh, maybe once in a while you read the other guy and go, ah, ha, ha, what an idiot. Um, but that's also just to reinforce your, your, your predispositions in other ways. So, so you can do that fine, although it can lead you down a, one of those big uh-oh paths if suddenly you realize one day all the blue people are wrong and you're, you're immersed in that. Uh, then there's the fire hose. This is, <laughs> I post this on my blog periodically when I'm overwhelmed and just try to put a few things on the blog that are important. I call it from the fire hose. We're all, be we're all buffeted, buffeted, you know, the TMI, too much information is real. There's too much frickin' information. Although there's a woman at Harvard who wrote a, a paper called 2300 Years of Information Overload that you could Google for, and, and there have been past periods in history. That actually, when the printing press got going, people were saying, there's too much, there's too much to read. <laughs> Literally, in the Enlightenment period, there was too much Enlightenment. And there were people who wrote essays at that time saying, there's too much information. So it's not, not necessarily new, but it, does, it creates enormous challenges uh, that we're still just getting our, our heads around. So this, um, I sh shot this picture at the end of the climate talks in Copenhagen, 2009. Uh, we were all, after two or three weeks of nothing, basically uh, inconsequential talks, um, this cameraman expressed what, what any, anyone in this field faces, and, and especially given the feeling of information overload and these other issues I mentioned. So, um, and just to finally reinforce that, you know, it's an interesting moment 
we're in we're in zoom mode as a species right now we've been in zoom mode since basically since i was born uh, there's this if you go to populationaction.org there's a little tool there you stick in your 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 um, birth date and it tells you where you are on the curve of us and that that was that's my birth so two, i was there were 2.7 billion 2.8 billion of us when i was born now we're at 7. Point whatever and we're going toward uh, certainly toward 9 what happens after mid-century is anyone's guess, despite UN projections. There's, there's a lot of flex there. Uh, little changes in fertility rates can make a big difference between going toward 10, 11 billion, or staying at nine, or going even uh, down a little bit. So it's, it's, but when I look at this, you know, you could say, oh my God, you know, screw it, let's just all have a party, we're, 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 we're done. Or you can kind of say, wow, what a moment to be alive, especially for those who are born now, because uh, again, with information uh, uh, spreading, with, with the increase in scientific understanding of problems, including science has gotten a lot better at understanding us, you know, why we get some problems wrong, why we don't uh, recognize some kinds of risks. Put all that information together with the information revolution, and you can see, I, I think there's great opportunities to, to really have meaningful impact now. And you don't have to be Walter Cronkite or the New York Times uh, to do that. So here's my little, my little life course. This, as I said, it's actually been 32 years I've been a journalist. I've been to the Amazon. That was, I wrote a book about um, Amazon rainforest issues in, in 1990. That was the, the way we used to report. That was before the internet and there were hardly any telephones. I spent three months poking around trying to rebuild the life story of Chico Mendez. I've been to the North Pole and the North Slope of Alaska and Greenland. And Svalbard, four trips to the Arctic and uh, you, uh, that's a baby sturgeon on the Hudson River. So I've kind of had this amazing experience and privilege as a journalist to, to look at us in so many different ways and so many different parts of us for such a long time. And as these media have evolved, my first story about climate change was not about global warming. 1985 it was about nuclear winter. That was the, uh, the Cold War was still raging. And some scientists did some analyses saying if we burn enough cities, there'd be so much stuff in the atmosphere it would be like a super volcano, block the sun, we'd have uh, crop failures and have a uh, societal challenge, not quite existential, but a big deal. Uh, it became more nuanced within a, a year. Uh, scientists did more studies, more fine-grained uh, modeling, and it became, as Steve Schneider said at the time, uh, nuclear autumn. Just think about the difference between nuclear winter <laughs> and nuclear autumn as a sort of a cover story. So, so that says a lot about how science works. Sometimes the, the, the new idea is stark and, and scary, and then when more work is done, becomes more nuanced because, because the world is complicated. And uh, I have an artifact. This is a magazine. Oh, I got to show you one. It's any kind of crinkled and delicate. But so just 30 years ago, a science magazine Liquor ads on the back, <laughs> and Marlboro ads on the front. So, a uh, lot, you know, things change, things change. Uh, but this is something that's quite passing around. Uh, and with, with care. It's not quite ready for a museum, but getting there. So then 1988, I wrote about global warming for the first time in a big way. And you, you can see this says a lot about how we work in the media to try to get attention to issues. There's the melting earth, the freezing earth. It's uh, it's, what can we do that makes people engage? That's such an interesting part of the process. And how do you do that without looking silly or alarmist um, uh, is a challenge. I think these are both a little bit silly in retrospect, but it's just the way it is. Um, then I came to the New York Times uh, after writing a couple of books uh, in the mid-90s, and I learned a lot about the faster pace of the newsroom at a newspaper. A magazine is very leisurely, you know, you kind of do your reporting, you get time to, to, to talk to a lot of people and think and, and write carefully in newspapers like this. You just have to turn it around. Last week when the Pope was here, you know, I was turning around story after story for my blog. Um, and the limits of what you can do in, news, in a news medium with a complicated story became evident to me after uh, the first 10 years or so at the Times. And then I went, uh, to 2003, I went to the North Pole. And this is uh, what life is like in the North Pole. Remember, it's an ocean. The water under that, the water under that ice is 14,000 feet deep. And it's cracking and shifting. The sound you hear is the ice colliding with itself. You feel this, the, the uh, 
tank that we're on actually starting to fail a bit more. Probably the airline cracks up the... Um, towards the so does that mean we should back up? He's one of the world's leading oceanographers, and he'd been on the sea ice a lot more than me, but that didn't feel very satisfying. You can always jump over a crack. Um, and, but I got, you, you know, so what, what's interesting about this, I hope you recognize, is that, remember, I was a newspaper reporter, not a, not a TV reporter, but I brought a video camera. I figured if I'm going to go to the, literally the end of the earth, um, I want to come back with whatever content I could come back with. This is 2003. The Times already had a website, but not, we didn't have a video channel and stuff like that. But I just felt it was really important to, to convey the story as, in, as fully as possible. And the sound of that ice was unbelievably disturbing and, and, and an important part of the experience of understanding that the, uh, the ice cap at the North Pole is a dynamic, shifting, moving thing. It's not like a static ice cap. Um, and that was part of what I brought back with me. And, and then while I was on that ice, also we, uh, we, we cobbled together a, a, a reader forum. The, an editor of the paper, uh, one of the web editors said, hey, let's do a reader forum. And I, I'm camped out there on the ice for three days with scientists. And, um, and I had a satellite phone. And she said, you know, I'll put a note on the website that we're going to go, we're going to have people send in questions for Andy Revkin. He's at the North Pole. And that's so different than the way I would have worked as a reporter uh, five years earlier, which was you go out, you take notes, you come back, you write. Um, someone else does the photography, and then you move forward and you do your story and go on to the next thing. But it really got, got me hooked on two things. One, on capturing the story in as many media as possible, and the other was in, engaging with your readers. And that's the, the new news process is, is much more dynamic, it's much more interactive. Um, you know, people always sent letters to the editor, but the, how many letters did the Times used to publish when it was a print paper? Five, maybe, uh, every day out of hundreds? So now it's a much more porous and uh, two-way process. And that's what led me to blogging. I started the blog while I was still a news reporter at the Times in 2007 as a way to fill in gaps, as a way to uh, convey nuance, as a way to engage in, um, to make the journalism I was doing more of an open source learning experience. It's me, here I am, a journalist, trying to see what's real in the world, follow along in my journey, and hopefully you'll learn something. And, and it's, again, that's a very different model than the old that's the way it is model, which was very authoritative. Here we hand it down like the, like the uh, Moses and the tablets and, and then take it or leave it. And, and I think it's good. It's, it's, it's got all kinds of issues and problems, but I think it, it's a good way to, um, I, I think the journalists of this century who succeed will be ones who are like a guide uh, more than an authority figure. Uh, and, and, and who, that means you have to recognize uncertainty as well. And they're all, as I said, there are all kinds of challenges. I write increasingly not just about the science, but about how science communication. And there, there are all these traps. Um, there was a paper that came out about collapse of the West, Antar uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, inevitable. Now, the word collapse to those scientists is a centuries, centuries scale process. The word collapse to you or me is run out of the building, it's going to collapse. So, so you get these fundamental. Uh, misreadings of information, and when you when you tie that also to the the need for the journalists to get attention, and there's an R, there's a paper saying collapse of the ice sheet is inevitable. It gives all the wrong dynamics, and so I tried to kind of uh, do a piece about the different meanings of words, and and uh, it's important for the public to know that what was actually in that paper was that sometime between 200 years and 900 years from now the ice sheet will accelerate and in, into an, an inevitable loss of, of ice equivalent to a number of uh, several meters of sea level rise, but on time scales that are really hard to understand and to, not the kind of time scale that you could, um, that, that's very useful for policymakers. And, and those are just parts of the realities of these issues. Um, and then there are other things that I've learned about. It was in the mid, around 2005, after, by then, so like from 1985 to 2005, I was a very conventional science writer, writing about sea ice and glaciers and what's going to happen to the Amazon and, and what's going to happen to uh, extinction rates and how warm is it going to get. Very sort of technical questions, but all about the environment. And then it was uh, 2005, after, uh, after Al Gore's movie came out, um, there was the polarization and heat around the issue really intensified. And I started writing about why, why are people so angry about global warming? Why, are, why, why if the information is so clear? 
And it led me into this uh, understanding of the social and behavioral sciences. And actually now, I wouldn't say I regret, I wouldn't say I regret that I spent the first 20 years writing mostly about the biogeophysical aspects of things, but the key questions are really in the behavioral and sociological um, arena. How we react to risk, how people, two different people in this room will have completely different reactions to a set of data in terms of risk, uh, risk uh, response. Um, and I, I did a survey of, after I went, this website goes to, there's a guy at Yale, teaches in a law school, but he's a behavioral scientist, uh, Dan Kahane, and he, his work is um, consolidated there. And essentially, he's, he's found many th disturbing things, one of which is basically more information doesn't matter. Sometimes it does, but often, especially on a polarized issue, it doesn't. Uh, you've, I'm sure you might have heard about recent studies that showed if you take someone who's very strongly anti-vaccine and you show that person a pile of authoritative, trustworthy journal articles saying that vaccines are safe and efficacious, uh, it makes them more resistant to the message. And as a journalist, you know, a science journalist particularly, it's very depressing thing when you start to hear that that's the case. Um, same work has shown that um, on global warming, some of the most literate, the people with the most scientific literacy on global warming are at the edges, uh, people who are very worried and people who are completely uh, skeptical. Uh, and that, so, so more information isn't gonna take your friend who's a skeptic and make them go, oh, aha, I, I think we need a carbon tax. It, it's be, and one of the reasons, one of the hypotheses is that uh, essentially we've evolved so that, such that our tribal identity, uh, you know, whether you're, again, your tribe is Republican, Democrat, uh, Trump, whatever, uh, your tribal identity is more valuable to you than reality. It's, it's more adaptive. It's better to stay good with your tribe than to actually express what is really going on in the world. Um, and that, that, again, is kind of depressing, but it leads to, it leads to actionable information, too. And I thought, you know, I, I, I tried really hard to kind of break down aspects of the issue that I think are problematic. One is that quite often I've seen people, whether on the internet or just in a bar, they'll have a big fight about global warming, but they, haven't, they didn't bother to actually define the terms. And it turns out many times people are arguing about like the, a completely different vision of the thing. And many times it's, well, it's dangerous. It's, it's just that, no, I agree that greenhouse gases function. I just think it's not dangerous. No one's demonstrated that it's dangerous. It, that's very different than, so I, so I did this graph, like, and this is just like a very rough sketch of the shapes of climate knowledge. And, and some of the shapes, uh, these are just like bell curves to show you how little edge there is to some things. You know, the basic CO2 is a greenhouse gas, period. Uh, more of it in the atmosphere will make the world warmer. That, that's like bedrock. So I drew that as a very steep curve. This is from a long time ago. But the things that matter most to people, after decades of work, 20, 20 plus years of IPCC reports, are still highly uncertain. The pace of sea level rise between now and 2100 is, is pretty much where it was in my 1988 global warming article. And that says to me, we, some of the basic aspects of things driving sea level rise remain uh, very hard to understand, the gl uh, dynamics and ice sheets, that kind of thing. Um, hurricane frequency and strength, in my article in 1988, it was kind of a simple calculus that warmer seas will make hurricanes more ferocious. But now there's much more understood about that, and it's much more complicated. Um, pr the modeling now, a lot of models now project uh, fewer hurricanes will form in a warmer world, but more of those that form will become in, get into stronger categories. So if you're the mayor of Miami, that doesn't really change your relationship with hurricanes. It just says, if you, if you don't build with them in mind, you're in trouble, period. So I thought this was kind of at least clar clarity. To me, it, it helped to clarify some things. And it helps to explain, I think, why people can be sort of divided, because the how dangerous is, is it thing is a function of uncertainty you know, how you relate to the uncertainty around those. But then, just a, I just gotta show you another version of this. A guy named Russell Seitz, who's a brilliant man, he's at Harvard, he a, has a, a physics background, he's published, um, he's, and he's very playful, like just sort of one of these playful intellects. So he took the same curve, watch what he did to it. Remember, mine says the, the many shapes of climate knowledge, and he, he sent me this, he did it with uh, Photoshop. The many shapes of climate doubt. 
and, and he changed the words a little bit, still rivaled by local isostasy, present but lost in the noise, we're working on the problem. You know, so he, that, this is his interpretation of the same set of graphs. And again, that just tells you that very smart people, and he's not um, an arch skeptic, he, he, he thinks that the certainty has been over portrayed. And, and in some ways, I think he's right. Um, but it just shows you that two, two people can look at the same thing and come up with different conclusions. And here, and you know, here's the other thing. Having worked on this so long, you could say, oh, you know, I won some of these awards and blah, blah, blah. I got another one I'm getting from AGU this fall. And, and here's public, this is um, the, how much the public is worried, a, a good deal or a fair amount about global warming from 1989 to 2013. And basically, as I've said in some talks, it's, um, you know, it's kind of gone up and down and up and down, but there's no real trend there. To me, it's like water sloshing in a shallow pan. You know, if a waiter is carrying some kind of terrine, and you have to be really careful, and it'll slosh a lot, but the depth hasn't changed. The depth, the salience of the issue has not changed. Um, that's all the depressing stuff. So here's where I'm gonna start to uh, point out where we can go. We, and there's no we, but where one could go where I try to go. There is room for agreement. The same behavioral studies that show fundamental differences over global warming show some really interesting things about energy. Way back in 2009, when there was that Senate bill, uh, climate bill, being fought over ferociously, it had a cap and trade mechanism. The uh, support for cap and trade policy, this is a group at Yale uh, called Six Americas. And the, the bubbles are the six cohorts of Americans who have different they defined certain profiles, certain kinds of us who have certain feelings. And the feelings range from dismissive to alarmed. And the size of those bubbles has kind of shrunken and built over time. Uh, most of the people in the middle are basically, eh, you know, got other things to worry about. So this was, when you ask people, do they support cap and trade policy, um, even the alarmed, the people who are most engaged and worried about global warming were like, meh. My son uses that word. <laughs> We're just barely above yes. And every, of course, the dismissives are saying, no way, no way. So then watch what happens, though. You ask, support for providing rebates for purchases of solar panels and fuel-efficient vehicles. That's kind of interesting. Even the dismissives are maybe. And everyone else is yes. And that says, oh, that's interesting. Now, when I show this to economists, they go, well, that's because it's a, you're giving away something. It's a, you know. It's basically a freebie, it's a gift. So um, yeah, but then, then look at the next slide and you'll see that, well, maybe there's something else going on here. So support for requiring, requiring, mandate, that, that word is a mandate, that's like, that's anathema to um, conservatives. Support for requiring 45 mile per gallon fuel efficiency across vehicle fleets, even if it costs more money. And even then, everyone is either maybe or absolutely yes, except for the dismissives. And they're starting to drift south, you know. Uh, but that says to me, so I could fight for the rest of my life over this thing called global warming with somebody, or I can talk about energy efficiency and talk about, and actually this, I did a, there was another new study. It was a 50, 50 state study that I wrote about. If you just Google, Google for, it was, there's no red and blue states when, when it comes to renewable energy research. There's no red and blue states when it comes to uh, regulating CO2. That, that across both of those things, um, in our polarized media environment, you would never know that. But there actually is a lot of um, agreement on, on things like that. And I'll give you one other example. Um, there's, there's plenty of work showing that there, there are libertarians out there. Libertarians want limited government. They want limited control on their lives. And guess what they really like? Solar panels. They like to be off the grid. So I could, should I have a fight with a libertarian over global warming when he actually or she would support uh, incentives for expanding access to solar panels. I, I go with, I go with. Let's not have the fight over global warming. Let's go with what we agree on. Now, if you're if you're a partisan in Washington, that's not the, the the framing you want. Another issue where libertarians and environmental progressives agree is we're spending too much money subsidizing construction of houses and other things in places that we know will be flooded or burned. And this, this Huffington, Huffington Post a couple of years ago did a really good set of pieces on this. Um, and I wrote about, I've written about this so many times. In other words, uh, libertarians don't like subsidies. Uh, the Heritage Foundation hates subsidies. It's not, not exactly, you know, the Center for American Progress. But they, they, um, 
Um, so why should we be spending taxpayer money? I'll give you one quick example of how this works. Um, houses get built in Colorado in, in places called the red zone where we know there's high fire risk and they still get to get a, a, a tax deduction uh, for their federal mortgage payments on uh, the interest on their mortgage um, for, do it, for building a second house in a fire zone. That federally funded wildfire firefighters are gonna have to go and put out the fire and sometimes die. So there are people dying with taxpayer money to, uh, to protect houses that shouldn't have been built and that we, were, uh, that we helped subsidize. And that's with or without global warming. Global warming will exacerbate uh, fire risk in those places, but it's there anyway. So I say, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of finding common ground. Now, I want to get back to the communication opportunities uh, that you can pr explore. Now, here's uh, an example. This is uh, Inside Climate News was created by some foundations, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund particularly, and it, they won a Pulitzer Prize a couple of years ago for a series they did on pipeline problems in the Midwest. They just did this big expose of documents from Exxon. And they, um, it's not conventional journalism at all, but it's competing ferociously with the New York Times, the Washington Post, CBS, and sometimes collaboratively. And it just shows you that a new model is out there. How do you, how do you keep it financed? You know, foundations don't like to fund things forever. That's, uh, that's up to citizens. There's great opportunities for experimentation. I'm just gonna show you some examples. Uh, my friend Randy Olson, who's written several books about science communication, he calls, he talks about the nerd loop. The nerd loop is kind of like what we're doing right now. The nerd loop is talking to people about communicating better, as opposed to actually just trying to communicate better, uh, experimenting, uh, getting out there. Um, this was an experiment I did in 2009. Uh, Andy Bunn was a climate scientist. He was going to Siberia to study with students to, to look at the evidence for past climate change there and he wanted me to go you know like the conventional model like I went to the North Pole I said I'm not I can't go I don't have the money I said but you're going so send me some photos and some uh, audio clips of your observations and and I'll do a piece on dot earth from a distance and and this was kind of a new model that emerged I do these periodically kind of a postcard from the field and then the times ended up building on this at least for a little while there was a scientist at work blog that was created as a result, built on what I started doing here. AGU now, the American Geophysical Union, has a group of blogs that are really cool, that are doing the same thing. Um, Richard Alley there, he's a pretty prominent climate scientist at Penn State. Of course, he has tenure, so it's safe for him to make goofy videos about standing in cornfields talking about carbon and stuff. Um, now, I want to get into sort of graphics and creativity. 200 years, in, in uh, when was it, 1802, von Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt did the, what I consider the first infographic. There's a new book out about him, uh, Andrea Wolf, she'll be, she's in town, I think, on the 30th, uh, tomorrow. And I hope it's a bestseller. It's a history of, it's a biography of him. And this is this unbelievable cross-sectional view of a mountain in Ecuador that he, uh, that he climbed and studied the biomes as he went out. He essentially invented biogeography. He invented infographics. He did all this stuff. And there was just a paper in, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences just a couple of weeks ago. They, um, they, they went up the same mountain and they did some modern surveys. And, and one of the illustrations in the paper is uh, it's about climate change. Uh, guess what? These, these zones have changed profoundly since he uh, climbed the mountain in 18, uh, 1802. And they're just sort of drawing on that, that experience in, their, uh, in, their, science, in their, their scientific research. I thought that was really cool. Now, there's so much opportunity for experimentation here, and I'm always feeling irresponsibly way behind. Um, one reason I like to teach is because it forces me to keep learning. And uh, the other day I was sifting for, for something and, and I found this. Now to me, this is an, info, it's a, it's an infographic. It's quantified look at um, the different uh, footprint on a road of the same number of people in cars versus in a tram. Uh, and there was a version in a book that I had seen and I went sifting around to find it. I couldn't find that one, but I found this one. But I still haven't found, I'm quite sure it was in France and I'm looking I'm eagerly trying to find out who created it, so you, you get extra credit if you <laughs> can figure that out. But you know, what a great way to explain uh, congestion and um, the merits of public trans transit. It's just fantastic, and it's 
quantifiable. It's not arguable. That's the number of people. <laughs> it still amazes everybody. And now universities are getting into the mix here directly. As I said, with journalism shrinking, someone has, has to fill the gap. NYU is doing a good job. Um, University of Minnesota, uh, that's Pace University's Earth, Earth Desk blog by John Cronin. One of my colleagues, uh, Yale, has a very good uh, online magazine. And um, Columbia University, the, um, the um, Earth Institute. So, and because the information um, universe right now is flat, Anybody, if you come up with an impactful way of convey, conveying an idea or an issue or a problem or a finding, you can get it out and around remarkably efficiently. Um, and then there's the opportunities, like if you're a young scientist and you have a paper coming out on, in this case, blue whale. Blue whales have been doing really well off the California coast. Their, their, their abundance is way up. But it's such, it, it is such now that they're getting hit by ships more frequently. And so someone did a study about that. So, but while they were getting ready to publish, they also created a blog, Blue Whale News the uh, scientists behind it. And I think that tells you it's a way for the public to engage more deeply with their research. Um, it explains the backstory, how they did the work in, in terms the public can understand. And I think you know it's great to do the paper if you have time and the motivation. It's great to kind of build on that if you can. And if you can't, maybe your institution can help you. There's all this, these do-it-yourself opportunities now in Pennsylvania in uh, 2009 or so. A young legislative aide you know, facing the fracking uh, fight, he, he saw there, he knew there was a lot of data out there. There were a lot of data on well, where the wells were situated, on what the permits were, it's all there in some archive. And so he just put the data online in a clickable database and created a very effective um, uh, tool for the community. So now you click on one of these little widgets and you can find out who, who what company holds the permit, whether there've been violations, and they've added more layers to this in recent, uh, recent months. And just show, and he did that. He, see, he told me in an interview. He did it in just a couple of days. He found the data. Put, I, I could never do that, but I'd love to find out. It's always good to know who can. You know, not everybody can do everything. Uh, and the internet, it makes, as I said at the beginning, you know, it can sell Coca-Cola or, or, um, or sustainability. It can also sell endangered species. I've written about wildlife tracking and the role of the internet. And this is, um, this is actually, this is legal. This is not illegal. Um, these are raised, you know, um, in sort of farms. Not that it's good, I'm just saying it's legal. So the internet can help you find a kinkajou, <laughs> but it can also, uh, it's helped extraordinarily, as I said a minute ago, it's a flat world now. If you, you put something on YouTube and it's effective, it'll be seen by thousands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, and that can create change. Greenpeace has worked really hard to use new media to convey to the public that when you buy a um, Kit Kat bar or a certain cosmetics that have palm oil in them, that has impacts you know, somewhere else, mostly in Southeast Asia. So they, with, with their partners on the ground there, they've done really good reporting that gets out there and gets used by people like me, because I can't be everywhere. And they're trying to protect orangutans. And then at the other end of the pipeline, they did really effective consumer uh, Consumer advocacy, not education per se, but they created this really um, popular videos in, aimed at European teenagers who are, buy a lot of Kit Kat bars. And the videos that went with this are um, pretty hardcore, but the hardcore is what teenagers like. And so it, the videos moved around a, a lot. And essentially it shows a, a guy in an office, he's taking a break. I guess Kit Kat bar had an ad, take a break, and it's like crunch. And uh, in the video, you crunch the Kit Kat bar, and it turns out to be an orangutan's fingers, like in the pack. <laughs> and there's blood, and it's pretty intense. But it, 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 all of this pressured Nestle to change its sourcing for its palm oil. So it, it's just another, an example. And then they, you know, then they did the sort of congratulatory video, too. Thank you, Nestle, for doing the right thing. And all this kind of, uh, if you try to improve corporate practices on how they source their palm oil 10, or 10 years earlier, it would have been much, much harder much harder. You'd have to pay for a big ad in the New York Times, hope that someone influential read it, and whatever. So, so it's a great moment in communication history, I think. I'm going to speed forward on some of these things. The hashtag, uh, Twitter is your friend. I, I'm a big advocate. I can teach you in a minute or two uh, the merits of Twitter. Not everybody likes it. The, the hashtag is a way to have an organized conversation and, amid all the noise. And um, it was invented. It was invented by a young guy 
who, who moved on to Google after working at Firefox. And one day in 2007, he said, hey, let's just use a pound sign ahead of a phrase or a, a term as a way to organize a conversation. So it was just, and you know, you think about inventions like photovoltaic panel or whatever. This is an invention that, that has been and can be transformative because this is what it does. The, the internet, as I said, is too much information, blah, 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 Bieber, Bieber, Kardashian, whatever. And then hashtags allow you to cut through that and have a meaningful conversation with people about some particular question. Farm hack is if you're interested in innovation on small farms. Enviro Ed is environmental education, uh, which is what my wife does. WJ Chat was web journalism. I got to take it off there because it's not happening anymore. Education technology, media pace is the hashtag for my students and onward. So, so and here's some scientists who, who've dived into this area uh, uh, with success on climate change. You probably know some of the names. Um, innumerable examples of experiments that are really exciting in, in uh, India. Can you imagine being an agricultural extension agent in India where there are 100 million farming families? Not just farmers, farming families. And you want to get some brighter, some better planting method out there? Well, they've, they've developed what's called Farmer Book. Dig Digital Green is an NGO working there, which is farmer to farmer YouTube advice. Where, you used to have to go to the seed hall and, you know, or the tool shop and, hey, Joe, how are you doing? And, and that's how information spread from farmer to farmer. Now it's all, it can spread this way through, through Twitter and through um, videos because every Indian farmer doesn't have access to the internet, but every Indian village does. And, and think how transferable this template, this model is to other problems that were uh, sanitation issues, public health issues, um, Resilient building issues, it's just fantastic what's, what's possible. And we're just beginning. Um, that's just a flow of Twitter. Th this is um, exchanges related to scientific publishing. Um, I'm gonna fast forward. Even US ambassadors, like Scott Delisi, he's the ambassador. He was in Nepal until a couple of years ago, now he's in Uganda, I think it's Uganda. And, and he's, think about an ambassador 10 years ago. All he did was put on a suit, go to a cocktail party, and that, you know, that was it. And now his main interface with the pop populations he's trying to engage with is social media. And I think that shows you what's happening. And if an ambassador can do it, anyone can do it. And a couple of more experiments uh, that excite me. Um, several years ago, this guy, Isaac Fresha, he was an undergraduate art student in Nova Scotia, in Halifax. And uh, for a class project, he created um, what looks like a Facebook conversation, but it's, it's not. You can see when you look closer. It's a conversation among endangered species. Tiger says, totally screwed. Like 3,200 of me left, sad face. And then Panda likes this. And then Panda says, I, I don't mean like, like good. <laughs> you know, I mean like, like I feel you, brother. I'm around 2,500 now. And then it goes on. And, and this was sent around, this went around tens of thousands of times. It was forwarded and favorited and whatever. And it was linked to an, endang an endangered species uh, uh, initiative of the World Wildlife Fund. And, and just think, you know, if you were a, a, an undergraduate in Halifax 10 years ago and you wanted to influence people, what would you have done? How could you have done that? And so here he's just dove right in and had, and had a really, you know, a meaningful impact. Is that going to change the world, that one thing? No. But, but the, uh, if that becomes a practice and a common effort, then, then it can. That's why I teach. Again, I, I think this is... Uh, a great moment. Um, and then uh, some things are more technical, like if you care about fracking and you're not, and you're trying to make the story, convey the story through conventional photography, it's like hitting your head against a wall. But if you try um, infrared camera, things get different. The picture I'm going to show you in a second is a blue sky Colorado day. Um, and then that's the same tank uh, using an infrared video camera. So I'm just going to back it up so you get the idea. Uh, wonderful blue sky day, nothing wrong with that tank, except it is leaking a lot of volatile compounds. And methane is probably the main one. Can't tell without doing more work. But that, that would, it's become a way for people to go on YouTube, post a video of some infrastructure in your area and say, hey, this is not right, DEC or EPA or whoever, come fix it. I just think, again, a right tool for the right job. Now I'm going to show you a video that, that's... Um, was created by a small Danish, um, for a small Danish TV station. It had a big impact.
That's the company that did it. So, you know, that, and, and that, I think it's fantastic, a little simple educational nugget uh, for, um, for um, a science, you know, fourth grade science class or whatever, or for just the average person to say, oh, I, I get it. There's a lot of weather variability, and, but climate is this background forcing. Um, and, but it was just like in a Scandinavian TV station, right? It was seen by a few hundred thousand people. And then I wrote about it, others wrote about it, it sort of circulated on, on the web, seen probably by started getting seen by hundreds, hundreds of thousands of other people. And then along comes Cosmos. Um, and and you've you got to watch this. It's pretty funny. So this has been seen th theoretically by, I think, 500 million people it's around, the, around the world. Not, this, not every person saw this episode. But watch. Um, this is kind of, you'll see. So I wonder where they got that idea. <laughs> now, there's no credit line or whatever, uh, and maybe the Teddy TV guys are frustrated about that. I, I posed this question on Dot .earth one day. I, you, you know, a good idea is not necessarily patentable or copyrightable. But what it does say is that a good idea now can move around in a hurry. It can really uh, and amplify and be built on, and um, that's why the nerd loop, you get outside the nerd loop and let it all flow and some things will fade and fail and some things will, will work. I think it's a good, it says there's a lot of possibilities. Now the downside of course, and I, I say this all the time, think, you know, YouTube has been a very effective recruiting tool for terrorists, you know, and ISIS finds ways to get disaffected people from around the world to come to the Middle East to fight with it uh, through the same techniques. So none of these things are magic bullets, just like anything else. A uh, car can be used to uh, recklessly or, or constructively, um, but it's up to us to work at that. You know, you go into this arena with intentionality, with uh, betterment in mind, and you can make big things happen. So that's it for the moment. I'm happy to talk more about all this. And lots of questions. Uh, if you have questions, fire away. And you can always, again, follow me. Get on Twitter. You, you don't have to like tweet, but you'll, I think Twitter is really useful to experiment at least, poke around. And I think you'll find it um, useful. Thank you. Well, it's, um, it's, it's an all of the above answer that I'll give you. Um, bad behavior needs to be exposed. Uh, and I did a lot of that. This is back in 2005 when um, I was writing about, in the White House, political appointees from the petroleum industry were 
we're editing government reports, the final reports on climate science. Uh, and, and it was really great that a functionary said, hey, Andy, there's this stuff I gotta send you. And so that's, uh, that's all essential. Is it transformative is my question. And I think too much, too often the left, and, and Naomi and I are friends, um, um, implies that if we just expose the disinformers, we're all gonna magically decarbonize the economy. And it's so much harder than that. So, I, and I, I've written about that before in other ways. Um, actually, I'll just show you a, a cartoon that kind of, I think, conveys effectively. So it's, it's, it's essential, it's important, but it's insufficient to me. And so that's why I write about, I, I wrote a, I've written a lot about this, including on the blog, and including when those Exxon documents came out. Um, but, oh, here it is. Um, I gave a talk a few years ago. I used to do, describe this just in words. I'd say, you know, society is like a, boulder. Societal reliance on fossil fuels is like a big fat boulder. We like, we like fossil fuels. I mean, we're, we live with them. We heat and cool with them. We move with them. We uh, move information with them. We keep our food frozen with them, et cetera, et cetera. And we haven't yet figured out how to. So we're kind of in this comfort zone. And, and if you're Al Gore and Naomi Reskies, your job is to, with information or whatever you've got, is to move that boulder. And it's not easy. And uh, the disinformers, the and they know this. They, all they do is have to sprinkle a little fairy dust, a little doubt. So that's why the, the person up there has got a feather duster, because that rock is going to stay firmly rooted with just a tiny bit of effort on that side. So it's not an even playing field. It's not even about Coke money. Coke's actually wouldn't have to spend much at all and still have that rock stay in place. Uh, and so um, to me, again, it's, it's necessary, it's important, but, but it's grossly insufficient. And, and, and I get at this repeatedly uh, because I think our, our politics are still are also built mostly around fighting villains. And, and um, the other element that's missing there is Exxon is a powerful company because we need the gasoline and the diesel fuel that they provide to us and the heating oil that I heat my house with up the Hudson Valley. So it's, you know, who's the villain? Well, we're kind of, if you don't acknowledge that full cycle of responsibility, then it gets uh, difficult too. So anyway, that's my long answer. <laughs> Yeah. What are your hopes and fears for the Paris climate change? Uh, for the for the what? Hopes and your fears for the Paris. Oh, or the climate talks. On, on this, um, it's another step on a long path. Uh, I did a piece. Uh, anyone who thinks this is a transformative moment, transformative moment, like a, the same thinking went into Copenhagen, and the reality of the issue is that countries that need more energy um, need to, well, it, um, India right now, you know, I, I credited the argument that India needs more carbon space. You know, this idea that whatever's left, whatever time and space is left for burning fossil fuels, the countries that haven't burned any yet, that have, well, in India, there's 300 million people who don't have electricity. That's the same size as the United States. That's people with, with, who can't plug in or turn on. And um, so even as there, and this just was happening Today's Tuesday? Yeah, yesterday Modi was meeting with uh, Obama. I haven't kept track of what was said, but you know, India's point is we're going to push hard on renewables, but you can't expect us not to burn more coal. We have to burn more coal just to keep the lights on in our fast growing cities. And so that, you know, those realities are there and the treaty process I've learned in writing about it since, you know, the beginning mainly reflects what's possible. It doesn't really determine what's possible. One of the big shifts, I think, in thinking in recent years, even among the diplomacy arena, is a recognition that um, targets and timetables and enforce in, uh, enforceable numbers used to be the thing everyone was looking for, but that would limit who is going to come into the room. And so the, the shift came toward recognizing that a softer approach, it's, it, it'll always be slower than you want, it'll always be uh, more complicated than you want uh, is inevitable. It's the only way to get a global consensus is to have non-binding, aspirational, uh, but come to the table with your numbers kind of approach. And that's where we're going. And, and you know, I used to write these pieces. Uh, you know, I wrote, a, you know, back in 1992, the, first, the framework convention, the language was basically, we all pledged to try to limit global warming. <laughs> they never, def uh, oh, to avoid dangerous global warming, but they never defined dangerous. 
And then, uh, you know, 2009, two, degree, two degrees became kind of, we started to define dangerous. But, and then there was this idea in Copenhagen that you have to have hard targets in time. Goes. And that's where everything fell apart. No one's going to play that game. The United States is not going to play that game. India's not going to play that game. Uh, and, and then you have the separate issue of loss and damages and really poor countries who, who feel completely in the crosshairs from climate vulnerability who are saying, you need to help us too. Um, so do, uh, that could, sounds like it'll be a failure, but it'll only be a failure depending on your definition of success. And I think no one, no one who's deeply dug into the process is looking for a perfect instrument with top-down controls. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, no, this is one of the big issues in science is um, can you be a scientist and an advocate? Or, and um, I've written about this a lot. And I actually spoke with it. Uh, Naomi Oreskes, who came up, um, we just did a little video chat that um, while the Pope was coming um, where we discussed this. I'll, I'll just show you the piece. Um, that's not the one. That's not the one. Ah, or maybe it is here. Um, the bottom line is, and I said this in, I guess it's in here somewhere. Oh yeah, it's in this piece. I interviewed her and we talked about this issue, which she's explored a lot too. And to me, every scientist is a human being also. You know, you have, you breathe, you eat, you, you vote. And the idea that you somehow have to steal that off from having a meaningful role in society outside of collecting data is, um, would be so constraining. I, I, I'm not a scientist, but I would find that impossible. Um, but the thing that I think that is really important is to separate the two parts of you when you go into a public meeting or if you're blogging or, or whatever. And, and it, to me, it comes down to, I, I call it a two sentence rule. I'm a scientist, I study sea ice. Uh, there's big changes underway. I'm very confident that they're related to global warming, period, pause. I am really worried about this issue for the sake of my children and my community, and I think we need to do more to um, boost renewable energy use in our community, period. <laughs> Let's discuss. But by separating the two things, I think you, you, you insulate yourself from uh, loss of credibility in the science. And, if you, and not, everyone, not every scientist should you know, get into that arena, but if you feel strongly about stuff, that, that there are ways to do this and still, you know, retain your credibility, have an argument uh, that's solid. And it gets back to, uh, there was a climate scientist who, he uh, studied philosophy partially as an undergrad, Ken Caldera, who led me to, uh, I didn't study philosophy, and David Hume, a couple centuries ago, was the guy who said, um, you can't get an ought from an is. That is is science, is is what the world is, ought is, what we ought to do is really a function of values. And that's what, when I wrote about the Pope over and over again, I was at the Vatican for the meeting a year and a half ago that set the stage for a lot of what happened. Um, the thing he brings to this issue, and I'll be at Boston College tomorrow talking about this too, is he's, he's articulating that, that the choices we make are based on values, not just on science. That science is, science basically creates the boundary to the picture, but, um, our values determine, and it's, values can be a big, you know, there was, what happens is a result of clashing values. You know, we have the value of the now, people who value now more than the future. Poor people tend to value right now more than the future. They can't afford to think about the future. So, um, and then libertarians and liberals have different values uh, on global warming or abortion or all these other things. So, so that what gets done or not done is a function of sort of dynamic tension. But, but separating the is from the ought, I think, is a good starting point. And another question. So the people say, uh, Ram, do you believe, the question oh, yeah. is, do you believe right. in climate change? And right away the question, you just tie yourself in a knot. 
Yeah. Sure. Well, yeah, although um, in a way. Because it's like when you said the word collapse, I take yeah. the to mean something different than maybe. Right. As a scientist, maybe I take it differently. Well, you say I'm convinced that. Yeah. yeah. No, belief is a, is a very interesting word. Yeah. And, and it, it implies, you know, that's faith. That's yeah. I, I always say I don't believe in climate change. Right. I don't right. believe in gravity. Right. It happens. Right. Not. Exactly. <laughs> And I think that's a part of the role of scientists is to help clarify terms. The IPCC a few years ago got this terrible advice. I wrote about it um, where um, somewhere, sometimes I show this, uh, some consultants did a report for the IPCC, like a primer on what to say, how to communicate effectively. And they had this whole list of words you shouldn't use because the public doesn't understand them the same way you do. And the words included risk and uncertainty, uncertainty and um, but it was the, just the opposite to me of what should be done, which is to clarify what you mean and what the public means. Like, like the collapse thing. You know, when I talk about collapse, just so you know, this paper isn't about like run for the hills right now. It's not a tsunami. It's about something else. And then, but sci you know, sometimes scientists don't understand that. Just sit back there. Yeah, Yeah, um, I'm not a fan of the word denier in this arena. The AP, you probably saw the Associated Press recently put out a new style book saying they're not going to use that word in this context. Um, and there's several reasons, not just because of the Holocaust um, illusions, which I think are, are real. Uh, it basically means, it is a label that it's, mean, it's meant to say you're a jerk it, more than anything. And that's, if you want to engage in a constructive conversation with somebody, like think what I said earlier, Suppose that person also wants to have a solar panel on his roof, or like, uh, what's his name? The former head of the CIA drives an a, uh, so, uh, electric car with a solar panel in his backyard because he hates imported oil, not because he's worried about global warming. So, so do I want to like, hey, hey, climate denier, it's really good that you have solar, solar panels on your roof. Do you think that's gonna, is that really going to work? Uh, and, and by the way, the other reason I, I don't like the word is because there's denial all around on this issue. Um, those who think we can have a rapid transition to a zero carbon economy are in denial of that boulder. And it's just it, maybe not, I, actually it's just as profound. I, I, it's like when you look at the numbers, you can't get there from here tomorrow, you can't get there for, from here by 2050, you, but you can work on getting there. Um, so that's a form of denial. I was in denial in the sense that I always expected until 2005 that writing more prize-winning articles about global warming would make people, change people's minds. And then I stumbled into this science that said, you're in denial. <laughs> Information doesn't matter. So, so to me, that's the other reason denial, I think, is not a useful term. And they also dropped skeptic, and I think that was wise, because skeptic is, every science, scientist is skeptical, and science is Knowledge, scientific knowledge accrues because skeptical people poke at things until there's bedrock, you know, and, and, and they fight over this stuff because they're totally skeptical. And that's, that, that's a powerful norm in science. And no one should be proud to be a climate skeptic because it's some little corner over here. So anyway. Oh, yeah. It's good to be here. Well, uh, you have to have a relentless um, interest in the next new, new, uh, new way to do something. Uh, because we're, one thing we're in, we face is fast change in terms of which tools are the best tool. Um, it used to be, <laughs> things are so interesting. I was at Columbia Journalism School a week ago on a panel about climate data and journalism. And a young woman in the audience said, um, uh, her firm, they produce um, newsletters. She called them, she, she, she said, this, we, we do a lot of offline content. 
And I said, do you mean printed content? <laughs> Yeah, printed, printed like news, fourteen thousand newsletters. We print stuff, but just the fact she called it offline. <laughs> wow. So I don't know. And, and my students, something is already new. Like Instagram now is bigger than Twitter, and I, I'm way behind. I'm not. I have. I haven't really d dug in Instagram, Snapchat. My son lives on Snapchat, and so finding a way to keep sort of poking around and figuring out any of these tools useful or not. That, I think that, that that animated GIF I showed of the people on the street and then in the streetcar versus cars, you know, um, that just shows you, it doesn't have to be fancy to be impactful. Yeah, yeah, or right, you could take that same data, you know, it's 50 people take up X square meters. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, and will that change people's behavior? You know, we still like a car because it gets us to those more precise places than, than, a, than a tram does. It makes you think more, yeah. 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 Just a pen and question for just a quick sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe building scientific literacy in, in terms of our general public? And I'm also curious, even like the wide reach of your travels and sort of the interactions that you've had abroad, are these conversations easier to have if they take on a different amendment dimension abroad in places that may have at this time a slightly lower, a slightly higher level? That's at all, like, if that's even something to do. The data, uh, the Yale people and others have done uh, sort of some, some, they're pretty sketchy still, global surveys of attitudes on global warming. And mostly, it's not that surprising, countries that, well, China, the average person is, doesn't really, in China and India, most people don't even know about the climate change, weather, or whatever. It's not that there is, you know, the basic uh, literacy isn't there um, at all. Um, and then usually when something gets into the news, it becomes caricatured. Uh, anything about climate, uh, you know, a hurricane has got to be climate change just because it's bad and everyone's talking about climate change without the science being there. Um, and the, cha the challenges are the same everywhere. There are, there are some efforts, there's some really cool efforts underway to, um, um, try to foster um, the capacity to convey stories effectively. And, and, um, and Earth Journalism Network is a global network of environmental journalists, and it's very dynamic and active, and it's people in Nepal and um, Botswana and all over the world who are sharing uh, tips on how to create effective stories uh, on environmental issues. And that, that kind of networking, making sure, this gets to your question too, um, networking with your colleagues, university communications um, or um, uh, newspaper reporters in, in um, developing countries, getting, passing along tips on how to do something effectively um, is, is where I think the progress can be made. And then seeing if that can spill into classrooms. You, you know, I, I, uh, my, my, that book I wrote on the North Pole was for middle school students. I, and actually, I'll show you another, another innovative thing. At the Times, the next, um, Next month, I'm going to be a teacher at the New York Times. We now have the School of the New York Times, and I'm doing a, this is the five-week course, Tackling Humanity's Climate and Energy Challenges. So Saturday mornings, it's for kids who already, like, want to be science geeks. No one's going to, no Saturday, you know, there'll be kids on Saturday morning who just want to play soccer. <laughs> but, um, but they're, you know, they're, they're out there. And so, you know, I'm reaching down the pipeline, just, not just teaching in college, in all my capacious spare time, I'm going to teach. Uh, I just built this curriculum, and we'll see if it works. So, so you know, and any that's another opportunity to spill from universities into, uh, re, you know, the elementary and high schools around the university to build that kind of um, networking out that way. I think can make a difference too. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, it's it, it's a you know it's there's a lot of prospects to do things better there. To so when you get a label, you're looking at the label on something. You want to know well is the sourcing? Did they get their palm oil from a bad place or a good place? That's becoming much more doable, but it's kind of slow. But you know that arena, uh, everyone. I'm sure in this room there'll be divisions over GMOs, but you know stuff that's nonsense like uh, gluten. 
Have you seen uh, Jimmy Kimmel, or one of the night comedian, one of the nighttime talk show hosts, went into a park in L.A. and, and one of his guys, and they interviewed people about gluten, and and all these joggers and stuff. And one after, if you haven't seen it, we could actually show. show. One after the other, like, oh, I don't eat gluten. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I do it, don't do it because of this and this and this. And then, the, and then the guy, the, the person with the camera says, "What's gluten?" <laughs> and none of them knew what it is. <laughs> so I mean, again, that arena is full of confusion and misinterpretations, and I don't know. But I do think, like for shrimp, or I, we did a film. My students at Pace, we make films now. My students um, on environmental topics, and we did a film on shrimp farming sort of the good shrimp farming. And uh, the same year, students at the University of, Bis of British Columbia did a really good film about, they went to Thailand and did a film on, on sort of the worst practices in shrimp farming. And the shrimp farming that we looked at in Belize has become the standard in Belize. And the, none of the effluent, none of the water pollution, none of the pollu water ever leaves the shrimp farm. A anyways, really cool. So we, you know, we're out there trying to say, there are better practices for raising shrimp. Not every shrimp farm is the same. But here's where the consumer, you, somehow we need to be able to go to the market here and just look at the package of shrimp and know, say, okay, this one is trustworthy. And there, that kind of certification process is still behind, it's way behind for, for some foods. So there's a lot of work to be done. It's like, but it has to be all those elements. It's not just, um, if the consumer is not motivated, then all the labeling won't matter anyway. Any um, last questions? Yeah. Well, you could there there you know you could build a social media campaign. There probably is one. Um, and the one thing about Twitter that's interesting is every single elected official feels obligated to be on Twitter now. So um, let's just see who's talking about New Jersey Transit. Oh no one. Hold on. You can find out who's thinking about this, um, and then you can start to get together. You could make a um, a hashtag for I'm uh, just get, do, do, is it, uh, progress. I'm making this up, so you could start a campaign. This this is a campaign now, okay? And then you start to look around for politic. You look for background that supports your argument. You build a website, which is really easy to do, um, WordPress or uh, uh, medium.com and and then you start finding people you build a network uh, like-minded people uh, environmental groups that want to support this uh, um, groups that want to support it for cost reasons and um, and then you start pe pestering po po politicians I don't know who who that would be but they are all there and you can start to buffet them and and use you know look for creative graphics that make the point and uh, or makes make some find out who can make who in New, who would, who's a New Jersey transit user who has graphic skills and Facebook is actually really good for this um, yeah, Facebook is bad for a lot of things but um, there are groups you can create a group on Facebook and um, I don't know about your community but my community has a um, little slow here Let's see. oh and yeah, Phillips Town Locals is kind of like our little hub for everything we're thinking about in the community. It's way more efficient if something weird is happening, like there was an explosion or 
a lot of sirens, that's where we go to find out what's actually going on. Uh, and, but there too, you can say, hey, you know, I, I want to change how we um, want to build a campaign around transit, get your neighbors involved and, and their friends and their friends and you start to get uh, sort of critical mass. So the tools, these tools are really good for, for that kind of thing. Um, and feel free to get in touch with me. <laughs> so thank you very much. This is great. I'm glad you came. And uh, good night and good luck. That's the way it is. <laughs>